If we could all come in and take our seats, that would be great. So, good morning, and on behalf of our three society co-sponsors, AGU, ASLO, and TOSS, welcome to this morning's plenary session. My name is Frederick Bingham. I will be moderating this session and uh, not spending too much time up here, I hope. But before we start, I would like to put in a word of appreciation for the cooperative efforts of the three societies that are co-sponsors of this meeting. And that's evidenced by this great session that we are about to witness. Some of us remember back in the days when there were competing ocean sciences meeting, meetings. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. <laughs> um, they were in different cities and on different days. Uh, those were the th bad old days, and thankfully that's just a, a bad memory. A few months ago, the three societies, the presidents and leaders of the three societies got together and reaffirmed their commitment to the ocean sciences meeting. Uh, so we can all look forward to future meetings like this, in which we hope will uh, go on into the future and prosper. So we have three award talks today. We'll start with the Monk Award from the Oceanography Society, then on to the Sverdrup Lecture from uh, AGU, and finally the recipient of the Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award from ASLO. So to start the festivities, we have uh, the president of the Oceanography Society, Dr. Alan Mix. Alan? Good morning. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Uh, I'm Alan Mix, president of the Oceanography Society, and I'm pleased to introduce the Walter Monk Award. Uh, which is given by this year's Monk Medalist, Andoni Lavery. The Monk Medal is administered by the Oceanography Society in collaboration with the Office of Naval Research and the Oceanographer of the Navy, and it is our highest honor. Walter is, of course, an icon in oceanography. We all are familiar with his seminal contributions to research in ocean circulation, winds, waves, tides, earth rotation, mixing acoustics, and even the orbit of the moon and the beginnings of seafloor drilling. Walter is a tough act for anyone to follow. His footsteps are both broad and deep. Walter turned 100 a few months ago. So I note that uh, Walter was born a year before AGU was founded. He was a young scientist at age 30 when ASLO uh, changed from being a limnology organization, adding the O to its name and becoming an oceanography organization. And he was 70 when the Oceanography Society was formed uh, just 30 years ago today. For Walter, that was mid-career. Uh, he's uh, unable to be with us today. Uh, I was talking to Margaret Leinen, and uh, she said that it was because his travel schedule is too full. His, his, his wife is trying to put a leash on him. Good luck. So happy birthday, uh, Walter. Happy 100th birthday. You're still going strong. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Teresa Poletkowitz of the Office of Naval Research, who will introduce our speaker. Terry. Good morning, everyone. It's with great pleasure that I'd like to announce this year's winner of the Monk Award, Dr. Andoni Lavery. And Andoni is one of the one of my superheroes. She's incredibly innovative and creative. She started out at Cambridge University, where she put an incredible background in mathematics and applied mathematics into her quiver of tools, and then moved on to Cornell University to study a dark matter and objects of deep physics, and added physical, the training in physics to her quiver, and then introduced oceanography while she was at Cornell she became fascinated with the way acoustics illuminates the ocean. And I quote Jim Lynch in saying that the beauty of acoustics in the real ocean is that it illuminates everything, the biology, the turbulence, the structures. 
And so Andoni added acoustics to her quiver of tools and has gone on to create important broadband high frequency instrumentation to help us identify, study, and understand physics, biology, marine creatures, and structures in the ocean. And she will tell you about this today in her talk. And we are so very happy to see someone whose footsteps are as broad and as deep as Walter's receive this award. So I'd like to welcome Andoni to the stage to receive her award. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real honor to have received the Walter Monk Award, especially this year as he's turning 100. Um, I hope I can live up to those deep and broad footsteps. Um, so I will start with <clears throat> just a quote that uh, sort of I was thinking about as I was preparing this talk, and that is a quote, quote by Walter Monk. And that is, if you apply significant technical innovation to a field of general interest, then you cannot help but learn new things. And that is sort of the inspiration that, um, let, I think that's the, the, the sense of the inspiration that led me to do a lot of the research that I've done. So before I get started, though, I do need to um, just thank my, uh, my incredible suite of collaborators. I have uh, collaborators across fields um, in uh, physical oceanography, in acoustics, in biological oceanography, um, uh, molecular genetics. And so um, while I can't mention all of them by name, many of you are in the audience. Um, but I do want to pull out Tim Stanton, who was my postdoc mentor. And uh, without him, I can guarantee that I wouldn't be here. Uh, he has been a thoughtful and steady mentor ever since. And I, while my funding, uh, I thank all of my funding agencies. I would especially like to pull out the uh, Ocean Acoustics Program at ONR, uh, who helped me build the foundation of my research program. And so with that, I will start with what motivates my research. So the, the, the motivation for my research is I am interested in developing acoustic tools, acoustic remote sensing tools that help us address questions that are difficult to address with other tools as a complement to a suite of other uh, tools that my physical oceanographer and biological oceanographer colleagues use. So my work has been focused all the way from the shallows of the Connecticut River, um, I'm afraid I can't point, um, from the shallows of the Connecticut River out to looking at prey field characterization for marine mammals and still wagon bank, looking at copepod distributions in the deep basins of the Gulf of Maine, uh, krill distributions in relation to herring spawning on George's Bank, and then also all the way out to the, shelf, to the New England shelf break and uh, the canyons of the New England shelf break, looking at things like the shelf break front, internal waves generated at the shelf break, and how do they dissipate energy. Um, things like um, uh, the... the um, things like shear instability, uh, hydraulic jumps. Basically, the, the, the idea being that anywhere where there's strong stratification and significant biomass, those are the perfect places for acoustic tools to be used. So as you can see, all of these areas are um, very different. And the sampling problems that uh, you have in these different areas require different tools and different platforms. And so it's not just the development of the sensing tool, but also the platform that you, that you match it with that allows you to address some of the questions that are pertinent in these different regions. And so you know, what I'm trying to do is to develop acoustic techniques and then capitalize on the developments that we've had recently in the, well, recently in the last decade or two, what Walter Monk would call the technological revolution in sort of AUVs and uh, autonomous platforms, um, and um, uh, um, ocean observing systems, drifters, how do we capitalize on all of that and, and merge them with our acoustic, with our acoustic tools? <clears throat> 
However, as Terry said, I'm a physicist by training, and my core strength is in understanding the scattering physics. So I spent the first part of my career basically looking at how do we understand how different processes and organisms scatter sound. Um, this is um, uh, an illustration. It's by no means comprehensive, and not all of the models are models that I've worked on. And it just shows a basically target strength, so how much sound is scattered from different organisms and different targets. And it's as a function of frequency. Uh, the majority of the zooplankton myomass um, is made up of what, as a physicist, I'll call a weakly scattering organism. A weakly scattering organism is an organism that has material properties close to that of the surrounding water. Things like copepods, amphipods, krill, salps, siphonophores, except for the gas inclusion. Um, and a, a squid, these are all weakly scattering organisms, and we can model scattering of sound of them in a, using certain techniques. The key here is that all of these organisms, depending on their size, their shape, have a different spectrum. And so for these weakly scattering organisms, you can see that they have a Rayleigh scattering regime where they scatter sound in a very predictable way with a frequency to the fourth power dependence. And then you get up into the geometric scattering regime where the scattering is much more specific to the kind of organism that you have. Bubbles have a very strong resonance frequency. We can, extract, we can um, exploit that to characterize bubbles. It could be methane bubbles. It could be bubbles produced by surface waves. It could be um, gas inclusions, uh, pneumatophores for, uh, before siphonophores. It could be swim bladders of fish. But exploiting that resonance frequency tells us something about the size of the organism. Uh, I've also been developing scattering models for double diffusive interfaces, for shear instabilities, for turbulence and trying to put all of that together to basically characterize the different processes that we have in the ocean. However, to do that, we obviously need to have a certain spectrum. We need to have enough bandwidth. Now, while acousticians have used broadband sound since the beginning of time, that is the 1900s, um, um, for some reason, fisheries acoustics and scientific echo sounders were really restricted to narrowband signals for a very long time. So what I spent the first part of my career doing was basically developing um, uh, uh, systems that would allow me to transmit broadband sound and use that sound to, to uh, map the spectrum of these different scatterers. So here you see a signal which is two milliseconds long. This is a very standard signal that I use. It's got about 100 kilohertz of bandwidth, which you can see in the spectrum versus frequency response. And then the idea is that you can do um, some signal processing. You'd use a match filter, and that compresses the signal and basically gives you improved spatial resolution. And the reason that's important is that you can get down to really fine scales of resolution on the order of half a millimeter, on the order of about five millimeters to a centimeter. And that allows you to image a lot of things in the ocean that are otherwise very hard to sample. So for example, here you see an image that we collected recently. These are shear instabilities in the Connecticut River. And you're going to see a lot of these, so I'll explain what it is. Um, uh, this is uh, a long track distance. So you ping, you listen for the return, you ping again, you listen for the return. Um, you can plot the horizontal axis as time or distance or ping number. The vertical axis is range, so how much scattering you're getting as a function of range. And the reason I bring this up is that this is a 100 kilohertz band with one millisecond signal. If that was um, a narrow band signal, your resolution would be about 70 centimeters, and that water column would be eight bins big. You wouldn't see the shear instabilities. Um, and so with this, with this particular signal, we have about seven and a half uh, millimeters of resolution, and it allows us to really image uh, that shear instability in addition to actually collecting the spectral information. So what you see here is actually the output of the match filter. So it's not at one frequency. This, this, this uh, image contains information at all frequencies, which with a bit of signal processing, we can then extract the spectrum at particular locations. So I developed a system. This was an edge tech system. It was, it's, not a, it's not an off-the-shelf system. Um, and, so, and I put it on a whole bunch of flat platforms. And I chose the platform in order to address the science question that I was interested in addressing. And to keep my physical oceanography colleagues and my biological oceanography colleagues happy, I picked two examples of each just to show you what I do. 
Okay, so this is the very first deployment. This was with Jim Moom off the New Jersey continental shelf to look at internal waves. And his interests were in mapping basically how much mixing, what's the dissipation of energy as these internal waves um, travel across the continental shelf. And so this is broadband image of an internal wave. And if I had time, I would go into lots of detail about all the interesting things that you can actually pull out of this image. However, for the sake of this talk, I'll just say that uh, the bright scattering in that first internal wave trough that you see and the subsequent troughs after that, and you can see that there's a lot of high intensity scatter. And that's associated, this was a very temperature stratified system, so that is associated with temperature microstructure in the dissipation subrange, which is what you can see in the black line. However, what we also saw was that there was a very strong signal from, uh, from zooplankton. And you can't see it at this frequency, this is one particular transducer, at a different higher frequency transducer, you could see a scattering layer underneath the internal wave, which you actually cannot see at this frequency. However, that was zooplankton, so you can see that there's a very strongly increasing uh, spectrum with frequency, which is why for the frequency that I picked, you can't actually see it. So this is, a, this is now the Connecticut River. Um, this is, a more, this is um, data from 2009. This is in collaboration with Rocky Geyer. And so this was, I was very, after completing the experiment with Jim Moom, which was a very strongly temperature stratified environment, I was quite interested in what's gonna happen if we pick an environment that has strong salinity stratification. Will we be able to map salinity microstructure in the same way? And so I developed a scattering model um, that included salinity microstructure, and we went off to the Connecticut River. My platform is a pole mount on a boat. So, well, that's very appropriate for this particular environment because this particular environment is very shallow. And so the thing about um, acoustics is that as you go up in frequency, you attenuate strongly. And so the idea is that in a very deep environment, you're going to have to get into the water if you want to cover all of those frequencies and you don't want to attenuate the higher frequencies. So this particular environment is shallow, so we can get away with a surface pole mount, very simple. Um, these are shear instabilities. Um, I think um, uh, this is just one example of a lot of data that we have on shear instabilities. And the idea was that uh, you can see the spectrum, which is the gray line, matches the theory which I had developed for scattering for salinity microstructure. And we were able to actually um, invert that to look at dissipation rates um, of uh, salinity variance and easily distinguish between the salinity microstructure and the suspended sediment, which have a, uh, which are, uh, have a scattering spectrum, which is consistent with um, a Rayleigh regime, a small particle in the Rayleigh regime. So if we look at that particular echogram and we do an inversion, um, what you see on, the, on, on this on the right is uh, basically acoustically inferred uh, dissipation rate of salinity variance at incredibly high resolution. So um, uh, the microstructure measurements that we have, we can either, either profile a system, in which case you get very high um, vertical resolution, but very poor spatial resolution. Alternatively, you can put point sensors in, but you're, going to, you're only going to get a certain amount of vertical resolution. So here we were able to do this inversion at incredibly high resolution, which is what you get from using broadband acoustics. So now from my biology colleagues. Um, this is a, a collaboration with Gareth Lawson and Peter Wiebe, and we were looking at uh, krill distribution and abundance in George's Bank in the Gulf of Maine, and we actually did two surveys, and we were interested in the distribution and abundance of um, krill in relation to herring spawning. And so we went out before and after the known herring spa spawning season, and we looked, and what we found was that the distribution, and, um, while the distribution remained broadly similar, the size of the krill was different. The mean size of the measured krill, these are acoustic measurements that you see, you can see the spectra. We have a very robust model for, the, uh, for scattering from krill. And so we saw a much lower abundance and a smaller krill. Um, and so that was, that was nice. Um, this is uh, another application, and in this case, the platform is a deep toed platform. So I took my edge tech system and I put it onto a 500 meter depth rated tow platform so that we could profile through the water and obtain full spectra, um, full acoustic spectra down to a great depth. And so this was a um, a project to look at uh, the impacts of ocean acidification on the distribution, abundance, and shell quality of pteropods. And so this is just a typical echogram. And uh, what was really neat here was that we were able not only to um, see uh, patches of pteropod, and they were really very patchy. And so that's one of the interesting things is that using acoustics, you can really begin to address some of the questions about patchiness of organisms in the ocean. 
Um, and so the black line is the, the curve, it's the model fit for the data that we had on pteropod scattering. But we were also able to see krill, um, uh, krill patches and also able to actually uh, look at some of the scattering from mesopelagic fish. And the thing about mesopelagic fish is that um, there are very few scattering models available um, to describe the scattering of sound from mesopelagics. So, um, um, so that's something that is definitely an open question. So, so you know, while I, 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 I milked my instrument for all that it was worth, uh, in 2015, um, Simrad came out with a system that was a um, hull-mounted system, a broadband system, covering frequencies very similar to my own. And the great thing about this is that now this technology is open for everyone to use. And so that's, that's, that's great. Um, we were able to use this system just before it came on the market, and this was a project to look at the distribution. So this is now using the Simrad um, broadband system. This was a project to look at the distribution of uh, butterfish, and, and at the time that this, we wrote this proposal, the butterfish uh, fish, fishery in New England had closed down. Turns out that it's come back. Um, but at the time, that year, it was closed down. And so we were uh, wondering about uh, whether we could quantify the bycatch of uh, butterfish. And, um, and so we went out and we looked for butterfish. And um, what you see on the left are just two of the broadband frequencies that we had. And on the right, you have uh, uh, what we found was a lot of krill, actually, because we went out to the, to, to the canyons. Of, we went out to Alvin and Atlantis Canyon. And um, you see uh, the different echograms here. And again, we did a very good job at both modeling and mapping the distribution of krill. Butterfish were deeper, so there was slightly less SNR. Um, and you know, there's no, butter, there's no butterfish scattering model. So the blue curve that I've drawn there is a chi by eye scattering model. It is not real physics. Um, it's something that really remains to be worked on um, in order to understand the scattering. But we were able to find them, and we were able to distinguish them from other scatterers. And they have this very unique scattering uh, response that we don't typically see. So um, I hadn't yet managed to put my system successfully onto a, onto a vehicle. And Simrad came out with these uh, sonar boards, which were uh, very compact. And so we basically tore off the housing and integrated them into a Remus 100. And that we did in 2017. And the idea here, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, was to look at, um, uh, to, to use this system to look at um, scattering from microstructure in buoyant plumes. And uh, so the integration went quite smoothly. And uh, the nice thing about the system is that uh, once it was integrated on 3 Remus 100, it was very quiet. Um, no ship noise to interfere with our measurements. And so we deployed this uh, last summer in uh, June 2017 in the Connecticut River. There is just a wonderful session this morning. I hope you managed to see some of the talks. And some of my colleagues were giving talks in there. And the idea was that so you have, um, we deployed this system in the, just uh, under the plume in the Connecticut River. So the idea is you have freshwater discharge that's coming out into Long Island Sound. And um, it's a surface associated plume. And uh, what we wanted to do was, it's very difficult. This plume is quite thin. And so in order to sample that surface layer, we wanted to get the AUV under the plume, looking up with my acoustic system in order to map what the distribution, what, what was causing the scattering. Was it sediment? Was it bubbles? Was it microstructure? Was it uh, uh, fish? Um, and so what we wanted to do is get the AUV underneath and map that. What, um, on the right, you see this is a, a, an X-band radar image from David Honiger. And um, you can see the plume in the image. And so the, the, this was part of a really big project with multiple PIs. And the main goal was to look at acoustic propagation in these dynamic plume environments. Um, we were interested in the shape, in basically the dynamics and the 3D structure of these plumes. And I should really say 4D structure, because they're moving quite quickly. Um, and so uh, this is a multiple AUV, multiple PI project. And I'm just going to be talking a little bit about my own. There are a, a, um, a number of talks and presentations at this meeting that um, talk in detail about this project. So this is um, just an image of the plume front. Uh, we, were, we used the RV Neil Armstrong as our home base. 
and then we had a fleet of small boats sampling the plume. And uh, we were, like I said, we were interested in the structure of the plume at all scales, all the way from um, 20 meter scale, which is what we saw. We saw um, basically instabilities, um, lateral shear instabilities along the, along the plume. We were interested in sampling those, all the way up to what is the, the, the overall structure of the plume and how is it being impacted by wind forcing, um, uh, uh, tides, uh, discharge, and a number of other factors. So I'm just going to show you a, just a little bit uh, um, of the data that we collected. So we had this was a long experiment. We had a lot of data. This is one image. This is an acoustic image. Uh, in this case, the uh, the broadband system was looking up. So you can see the AUV track. That's not the bottom. That's the AUV track. You can see depth and you can see distance from the front. This is just one crossing of the front. There were multiple crossings trying to look at, you know, how what, what um, how does this front evolve? the structure of the front, and what's causing the scattering. This is incredibly high scattering. This is minus 30 dB. This is really, really, uh, you don't frequently see that sort of scattering level. Turns out that most of the scattering at the plume front is due to bubbles. Uh, this is a convergence zone, and bubbles are being generated at the surface and advected down. So you have a very strong scattering signature due to bubbles. And so what you see um, in terms of the modeling and the inversion, that's the, um, I just used a model that um, David Farmer used in a paper that he published for size distribution of bubbles. Um, and, but the other thing that we saw, so, so, so you see the bubbles at the front, and they do a fairly good job at actually mapping the plume, the plume front and the structure of the plume. However, at some point, the bubble dynamics kick in, and you're now um, uh, combining both the structure, the physical structure of the plume, and the bubble dynamics. So there's the, the, the front section, then there's an intermediate section of this plume, which has this complex scattering, and then you have this, the, the thin plume part, and that's where we see scattering from microstructure and salinity and, and salinity microstructure. You can see um, in the image on the bottom left, you can see that there are shear instabilities, and that's what's, um, that's, that's what's generating the mixing. And um, we were able to pull out the spectral structure of, of all of those different processes, the suspended sediment, which uh, you can see in the magenta box, and see so the suspended sediment, which was uh, obviously higher scattering, the closer to the bottom. And so you could, um, quant but what we could really quantify was the salinity microstructure. And, um, and that was really, uh, that's, that's very promising. So I wanna end in my last few minutes talking about a project that has consumed consumed my time for the last year. Um, this is an NSF-funded project, and I have a very large number of collaborators on this project. Um, Peter Wiebe, who I think is in the audience, um, uh, Tim Stanton, Cabell Davis, um, and the idea is to develop um, a sense, uh, uh, a suite of sensing tools to look at the mesopelagic. There's been a lot of excitement about um, studying the mesopelagic zone. There have been sessions here at Ocean Sciences, um, and uh, there are sessions at the upcoming ICES meeting. And the idea is, what are the tools that we need to look at some of the really basic questions, things like uh, biodiversity, biogeography, uh, abundance, um, uh, distribution, um, of organisms in the, in, in the mesopelagic zone. What are the right tools that we need to do this? And obviously the right tools and the right platforms really depend on the question that you're asking. So um, there are many tools. However, if you're gonna be using acoustics, the problem with using a surface vessel with acoustics is that you're not gonna be able to use very many frequencies and look at the mesopelagic zone because you're talking about depths of 200 to 1,000 meters. And that means that your highest frequency is probably gonna be on the order of 50 kilohertz. So if you think about those spectra, many of these organisms are quite small. There's still lots of fluid-like organisms down there that don't scatter a lot of sound at those frequencies. So if you want to see them at least using acoustics, you're going to have to get an instrument down into the mesopelagic, or at least closer to the mesopelagic. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that uh, many um, of the questions that we want to address, you can't address using acoustics. Um, and so we've been developing a system that we call the deep sea system, and it has a combination, a suite of sensors. It has an acoustic system spanning frequencies from a kilohertz all the way up to about 450 kilohertz. It's um, split beam, so you can follow targets, individual targets, and get target strengths, not just of the volume, but actually of individual targets. 
The low frequency array, um, I think, as far as I know, there's not much like it out there. Um, uh, and, um, but by itself, you can't answer all the questions that we wanted to address. So we added um, uh, high resolution cameras. So you can see out the front, there's a large area camera. It's actually a stereo camera so that we can look at sizes of organisms. Uh, we added a holographic camera so that we can get um, images of the really small, the much smaller organisms. Uh, there's a suite of environmental sensors, and my colleagues uh, Chip Breyer and Annette Govardhan are trying to um, are a, going to be adding a, a super sampler so that they can look at some of the molecular analyses as well. And it's this combination of sensors, I think, that is going to allow us to get at some of the questions like what is the biomass of organisms and the diversity of organisms in the mesopelagic. Uh, how are we doing? We have all the subsystems built. Uh, we're testing them. Uh, we have a few critical things missing, like a tail section. Um, we have an engineering test and evaluation cruise, which is coming up in August, which I'm really excited about. And we have a science cruise, and hopefully we'll be doing science in that test and evaluation cruise. Um, but there's a formal science cruise uh, scheduled for next summer, for summer 2019. And uh, so we're really quite excited about this system. And um, so I am going to end with a quote from Walter Monk. Uh, the key product of the technology revolution is sampling. And I hope that I've shown that we can make some uh, contributions using acoustics towards um, adequate sampling of the ocean. And uh, I will end with happy Valentine's Day. And I'm happy to take any questions. There is time for a few questions. Please come up to the microphones. In, there's one in each aisle. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that lovely talk. Just completely out of curiosity, how do you create a, an acoustic scattering model for a thing like a butterfish? <laughs> is, it, is it done in the laboratory, or is it a theoretical calculation? Do you have to do one for each different species? What, what is, how, how, do you, how does that work? Well, so that, that's a really good question. So you start with the wave equation, um, and you assume some boundary conditions, and you assume a shape, and you solve the wave equation. Um, you can use uh, numerical approaches. Um, that's not my forte. I prefer to use analytical approaches. So most of the models that I develop are uh, more general models where you sort of, you could start with, OK, it's a sphere. Most of the models that were in existence 30 years ago, everything in the ocean was a sphere. And so you would basically calculate the volume of a krill, and you would make an equivalent spherical uh, model. And as physicists, we're very good at spheres. And so you know, we came up with a great model. And then slowly you said, OK, well, guess what? The wave equation, we can solve it for an ellipse. And so OK, let's make it elliptical. Now let's make it a cylinder. Now let's make it a bent cylinder. Now let's, you know, and so your models progress that way. Um, another important pa part of the models is the material properties. And so um, you try to measure the material properties, uh, density and sound speed. So we have uh, little devices that we use to measure the sound speed, the average sound speed of organisms. Um, it's, um, and then, of course, you want to test it in the lab. So we do do. Luckily, I've managed to avoid these because I'm not a big fan of tethering live organisms in a tank and actually doing the scattering measurements. But a lot of people do them, and it's a necessary step. Um, and so, you know, we t we do test them in the lab, um, and. Uh, it's actually much harder with uh, turbulence because you can't tether it in a lab and there's always things moving and it's hard to keep the stratification and you know, so actually that's actually much more challenging I think than the organisms. Although tethering a one millimeter copepod in a tank is also not a whole lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> more questions? Please come to the microphone. I could have talked for three more minutes. Oh, okay. All right, you answered them all. All right, thank you very much. All right, before we run on to the next award talk, I want to uh, uh, remind you that we have two more plenaries coming up. One is going to be 
a special last minute addition to our program, NOAA Assistant Administrator, or new, newly appointed NOAA Assistant Administrator, Tim Galudet, will be speaking at 12.45 tomorrow on Thursday. And then we have at 4.15 p.m. on Friday, Mike McFadden will give kind of a final wrap up plenary uh, with his impressions of the meeting. So our next introducer will be Eileen Hoffman, who is president of the Ocean Sciences section of the AGU. Eileen. Okay, um, thank you, Fred. Let's see if I have my slides here. Okay, probably not. Okay, there we go, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome everyone and to also introduce the person who will be presenting the Harold Sverdrup Lecture, which is one of the Ocean Sciences Awards. Um, Sverdrup was an oceanographer and a meteorologist who made fundamental contributions to the understanding of ocean physics, chemistry, and biology. He's known for developing the dynamical balance that describes wind-driven ocean gyres, which is a sphere drip balance, the critical depth hypothesis, uh, which provides a dynamical explanation for initiation of phytoplankton blooms. Among his many publications is the book, The Oceans, Their Physics, Chemistry, and General Biology, which he co-authored with Johnson and Fleming. And this book provided the basic oceanography curriculum for several decades. And I suspect many people in the audience here had their introduction to oceanography through this book. In recognition of Sverdrup's many contributions, the Ocean Sciences section established the Sverdrup Lecture. And this lecture is part of the AGU Buoy Lecture Series, which was inaugurated in 1989 to commemorate the 50th presentation of the Bowie Award. The Sverdrup Lecture is presented biannually at the Ocean Sciences Meeting and the Fall AGU Meeting to distinguished scientists, by distinguished scientists who have made outstanding contributions to the basic science of the atmosphere and oceans and and or unselfish service promoting cooperation in atmospheric and oceanographic research. Today we continue the Sverdrup Lecture, Distinguished Honorees with Sybil Seisinger, who is the Executive Director of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions and a professor in the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria. Sybil did her graduate work, let me change slides here. There we go. Well. Yes. Sybil did her graduate work at the University of Rhode Island under the guidance of Scott Nixon, and she credits her graduate studies with providing her with a broad and diverse background that has allowed her to successfully pursue a wide range of research topics. Her research is focused on nutrient biogeochemistry in coastal marine and freshwater ecosystems, and it spans scales from the molecular to global and includes the impact of human activities. In addition to research, Sybil has a long history of promoting marine science and global change research. She was the executive director of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, and in this capacity, she facilitated and coordinated a network, a global network of scientists focused on global environmental change research. And during this time, she led the IGBP in its transition to policy relevant research and a focus on research for solutions and she also served as the president of ASLO. Her achievements have been recognized by numerous awards and by her election as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So Sybil, the Ocean Sciences section of the AGU is proud to recognize you as the 2018 Sverdrup Lecturer. And please. <laughs> I now invite Sybil to come and make her presentation on nitrogen hunting from land to ocean. Thank you, Eileen, for that introduction. And I'm very honored and grateful to be giving the Spedrup Lecture this year. 
Um, and I wanted to start by acknowledging my many collaborators through the years who have um, joined me in the hunt for nitrogen from land to ocean. There was a problem that was becoming ever more apparent in estuaries and coastal systems around the world in the early 1970s, and before many of you here in the audience were born. And um, we thought we had some idea of what the problem was, but it turned out that we were wrong in many respects, and the solution is much more difficult than we had anticipated. And the problem, of course, that I'm referring to is algal blooms in many coastal areas, as well as the development of hypoxia around the world. And so the question became, what is the driving mechanism behind this eutrophication of our coastal systems? A very early analysis pulled together um, phytoplankton chlorophyll biomass um, in a wide range of estuaries and saw that there seemed to be a relationship with river nitrogen loading. And so that led to the question of where is this nitrogen coming from, from the terrestrial environment? How much of it is getting into our rivers and then into our estuaries? And so the hunt for nitrogen began. Um, there were a number of um, early analyses of budgets of nitrogen in estuaries in the 1970s and some even before that. And they basically were focused on point sources, on sewage inputs. And, but a lot of the nitrogen in these budgets were actually sort of undefined, just sort of river, diffuse, um, land drainage, no real specificity as to what was behind that. And while these budgets took a lot of time of a wide range of people to develop, they really didn't provide any mechanism for projections into the future or for how the inputs could be decreased other than the point source. Um, and in addition, while there were maybe a couple of dozen um, at that time um, estimates of, of like this from various estuaries around the world, most of them actually were from Europe and from North, and North America. Um, and there are over 5,000 rivers around the world that enter into our coastal systems. So one of the questions became, how can we scale up from site-specific measurements to global scale insight into nutrient transport to coastal systems from our land, and what are the sources? So a, an international uh, working group was formed some of those people were much younger than they are now. Um, and what we did is we looked at, pulled together a wide range of nitrogen transport by rivers around the world and developed a model that, um, of how nitrogen from inputs into the watershed from a wide range of sources um, were, could, could predict the export by these rivers and then applied that model to uh, global databases to get the pattern globally of nutrient export. So just a little bit of information on that. Um, the input databases were um, half a degree by half a degree. The model was called, we call it the global news model, and I'll refer to this later in the talk as well. There were natural, or natural inputs um, in each of these watersheds, um, as well as input databases for anthropogenic inputs, including fertilizer, um, synthetic fertilizer, nitrogen fixation by agricultural crops, animal production systems, as well as atmospheric nitrogen deposition, and of course also point sources. That was combined with a number of hydrological and physical factors, moving nitrogen from the landscape into the rivers, as well as in river processing. And the output then for each of these 5,800 watersheds was river nitrogen export, to the mouth of the river as it enters into the coastal waters for nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and silica, and the various forms of these elements as well. So what did this show us when we applied this to these global databases? Well, it gave us the first real perspective on the global distribution, the global patterns of, in this case, dissolved inorganic nitrogen export to the coasts. And 
what wasn't too surprising was we saw high export. This is actually a yield, and so the, the load is normalized per the unit area of watershed. Along the east coast of the US, as well as the Mississippi, of course, throughout much of Europe. But what was really surprising, quite surprising, was the very large input in southern and eastern Asia. And in fact, um, about half of the total global dissolved inorganic nitrogen export by rivers enters into the coastal zones in southern and eastern Asia. So a very large um, component of the global picture. Well, what was the source of this nitrogen in these watersheds? And so what's mapped here is the single largest source. So we know that we have the others as well, but for this map, we've just shown you the, the single largest source in each of these watersheds. And you can see that while in the northern latitudes and throughout much of um, Africa and South America, that nitrogen fixation, natural nitrogen fixation, is still the dominant source. But in watersheds throughout much of North America, as well as Europe, and also southern and eastern Asia, it's agricultural sources, both from um, synthetic fertilizer as well as from animal production systems. So while we had thought that maybe sewage was a major source, um, based on some early box or models that I showed you. Um, in fact, it's really this diffuse source from agriculture, which makes it incredibly difficult to decrease that because it is a diffuse source and is coming from our food production systems. That contrasted, though, with phosphorus in that the dominant source of phosphorus globally in watersheds dominated by anthropogenic sources was from sewage. So here we had a big contrast uh, between the major sources of nitrogen and phosphorus. But the other thing to point out is in both cases that the anthropogenic sources dominate the natural sources at the global scale. Well, once this nitrogen enters into rivers, I mean, the river nitrogen enters into estuaries, what's the fate of this nitrogen? Of course, a lot of it's incorporated into phytoplankton, but then what happens to it? How is it removed? It can be permanently removed by burial in the sediments, but also in the sediments by denitrification. So the microbial reduction of nitrate or nitrite to nitrogen gas. Um, so a permanent removal from the system. And of course, what isn't removed within the estuary is available for being transported offshore to our shelf waters as we track nitrogen down the cascade. So measurements of denitrification in a wide range of estuaries um, from the literature and measurements showed that denitrification actually responded to increased nitrogen inputs, that as the higher rate of nitrogen loading in estuaries from land-based sources resulted in higher rates of denitrification or nitrogen removal, such that, in general, um, about 30% of the total nitrogen inputs from land-based sources was removed in the sediments eventually by denitrification. That means, then, that uh, that 70% that's not permanently removed within the estuary is available for being transported to the continental shelf for further processing. So how much of the river nitrogen is going to estuaries? Well, not all rivers enter into estuaries. So how much of the nitrogen in the, how many river, how much of the river nitrogen is actually bypassing estuaries and entering more directly into our continental shelf waters? Um, this has been quite difficult to track because we don't have detailed um, um, models of all the estuaries around the world. Um, but there are, have been some really interesting advances, and some of the earlier approach actually was to do a box model and use literature values um, for, in this case, the North Atlantic Shelf, both the eastern and western side of the, the North Atlantic. And six regional budgets were developed. Um, but don't focus so much on those regional budgets, but just that we took those and then used that to develop a, a budget for the whole North Atlantic Shelf, which we'll look at. And so the estimated river and estuarine export val numbers were up ranged between about 45 to 60 units of nitrogen coming into the shelves. There was another about 13 coming in from atmospheric deposition transported from land-based sources, primarily from combustion of fossil fuel producing NOx. The removal then was small for burial, 
But now how about the denitrification? So how we looked at that was compiled all the measurements that in the literature on denitrification in continental shelf sediments and saw that there was a relationship with sediment oxygen consumption. Of course, denitrification is associated with organic matter decomposition. And that that sediment oxygen consumption then could be related to primary production. So taking the primary production rates throughout the various regions in the North Atlantic Shelf, we could estimate denitrification. And when we did that, about 140 units. So as you can see, the nitrogen removal by denitrification far exceeded the known land-based sources of nitrogen on the shelf. This had been hinted at um, in a number of earlier papers, um, but this analysis really kind of drove it home. So where was the rest of the nitrogen coming from? We assumed it was coming from onwelling from the open ocean across the shelf boundary. Well, these were just basically box models using literature values, and a much more dynamic approach was developed by Katja Fennell, John Wilkins, and Eileen Hoffman, and others, um, where they combined the ROMS model with the plankton model and used the sediment denitrification relationship that we saw in the previous graph with primary production. And this was for from Labrador down to um, basically the, if down to Florida. So we're going to look just quickly at a simulation from this. And I want, I'll run it twice. The first, it's only 20 seconds. Um, it goes through an annual cycle. And first, if you could focus on the temperature and the chlorophyll, and you'll see the cold um, shelf or the cold water near shore, um, the Gulf Stream warmer water coming in, the primary production um, being very low in the Gulf Stream compared to the near coastal waters, and very high production in the estuaries. That's the Chesapeake and the um, uh, Delaware Bay and others. So now we'll run it again. And if you look at the denitrification simulation and the chlorophyll at the same time, you'll see a relationship here. Um, the denitrification stays um, quite close to shore, increasing in the spring with the spring phytoplankton bloom, staying high, especially within the estuaries and then very near coastal areas, and then decreasing as we go into the fall and the winter. So this was a much more dynamic um, approach to understanding the fate of the nitrogen in this region. They developed then a nitrogen budget from this, at the, an annual budget, and again, see that the river input, and this is for the area between Cape Cod and Cape Hatteras now, so a section of that, um, for the, um, of the whole simulation that we just saw. Now, the river input about be, being about two units, but again, the denitrification greatly exceeding the land-based inputs. And the balance basically coming from the Labrador Sea, current um, from in from the north. And there was small net exchange across the shelf break there. But the Mid-Atlantic Bight is not necessarily representative of all nearshore areas or continental margins around the world. And so how could we understand um, areas that maybe have much larger rivers, maybe narrower shelves, um, a very wide range of other characteristics in terms of what was happening with nitrogen, both in terms of the inputs and the export to the open ocean. So how much nitrogen was getting into the open ocean from rivers, either from export from the margins or direct, more direct input across the shelf into the oceans? And in general, um, open ocean models, um, global models, don't have the spatial resolution to look at the dynamics on continental shelves. Um, that either not only the hydrodynamics, but also the nitrogen processing. So basically, oceanic models um, have either assumed that all the river nitrogen gets into the open ocean, or none of it does. Okay? But there's been some recent advances, which I think are very exciting. Um, initiated by Jonathan, Jonathan Sharples um, a few years ago, and very recently refined further by Katja Fennell and Isaac, um, in which they are modeling the cross-shelf export of water, first of all, um, from rivers, so river plume circulation as a function of river discharge, latitude, 
which is very important because of the Coriolis effect, and winds and tides. So just briefly, you can imagine near the equator where the Coriolis force is very weak, that a river would move basically more directly off the shelf or through the shelf out into the open ocean. And then as you get further away from the equator with a stronger Coriolis force, you get much more of the water being trapped in a coastal current and less making it across to the shelf break. So with this model, they could not only estimate the amount of water being trapped in a coastal current or being moved off the shelf, but also the residence time of that water. So they applied this model then to global databases, actually all the 5,800 rivers um, in the global news uh, database, with a um, shelf, global shelf um, um, database um, to look at the efficiency of freshwater export across the shelf into the oceanic regime. And as you can see here, the rivers entering in near the equator have a very high efficiency, the red, of freshwater export across the shelf into the ocean. Whereas as you move away from the equator, the efficiency of freshwater transport or export becomes much less and more trapped than in these coastal currents and a longer residence time than on the shelf. So, for example, on the east coast of the U.S., the efficiency is quite low, down around 0 to 20 percent or so, so quite in, in line with what was found with that uh, much more detailed um, hydrodynamic biogeochemical model simulation that we just looked at. Um, and then we can kind of compare that a little bit with a very narrow shelf with a large river discharge, such as the Columbia River right here. And you can see one of those green dots where you've got still quite a bit of trapping of fresh water in a coastal current, but also a fair amount, about 40 50%, being exported more directly offshore. So this provides a great deal of a new input insight into what's happening in our shelves with freshwater um, efficiency in export. So they combine that then with the nitrogen concentrations for each of these rivers, the water residence time for each of those in the nearshore area, or the trapped in the coastal current, and a nitrogen processing rate um, ranging from about 0.75 per day to assuming no processing. And calculating that for all these rivers and summing it up, the it ranged from about 5% of the nitrogen in the river um, being exported to the ocean if you have a fairly rapid um, um, processing rate, um, or up to 40 to 50 percent it with essentially no processing in the coastal zone or in the no processing of nitrogen before it's exported offshore. Um, and the, the assumption, I guess, being that the particulate nitrogen is, is deposited and buried in either the estuaries or the shelf itself. So no transport of that. So we can, they combine that now with um, the nit actual nitrogen concentrations to calculate how much of the nitrogen in rivers is actually getting in now, do we think, to the open ocean. And we see that the estimate now becomes somewhere between about 1, if with these, this 0.75 processing rate, to 14 teragrams of nitrogen, maybe getting from rivers into the open ocean. Okay. So this is a really a big advancement, I think, in our understanding of the river transport. But of course, rivers aren't the only mechanism by which land-based nitrogen can get to the open ocean. There's also atmospheric deposition. Um, and some recent analysis has also shown that there's been a major increase in atmospheric nitrogen deposition into our oceans from land-based sources. The NOI being primarily from combustion sources, the ammonia being from agricultural sources, and the organic nitrogen is more difficult to um, attribute to, to various sources. But in overall, um, about 39 teragrams of nitrogen is estimated now to be input to our open ocean regions, and you can see the, the distribution there as well. So let's put that back into the picture. <clears throat> 
And now we see that we've got about 14, let's say, teragrams of nitrogen coming in with rivers, about 30, 40 coming in with atmospheric deposition. So atmospheric deposition is really dominating the land-based inputs to the open ocean. So our hunt for nitrogen from land to the open ocean. Now, it's interesting to think that this atmospheric deposition may decrease as we address climate change. As we decrease our reliance on fossil fuels, that that NOx emissions now will should hopefully go to essentially zero, so that some of this atmospheric deposition to the oceans will decrease. And of course, nitrogen fixation still is much larger than the sum of either of these, um, as well as the internal recycling of nitrogen um, is extremely important in supporting production in the oceans. Well, let's look at the picture here. The inputs of nitrogen to terrestrial environments globally is about 250 teragrams of nitrogen per year. Of that, about 43 end up reaching it to the mouth of the river before it enters into any estuary or, or ocean system. So thank goodness, most of the nitrogen that we put on our landscape ends up getting denitrified or retained on the landscape and is not getting into our coastal oceans. Um, or our estuaries. Um, but of that 43, we estimate now that somewhere between 1 and maybe 15 are making it to the open ocean through that, those mechanisms that we just talked about. Um, and another 39 from, or 40 from atmospheric deposition. We still don't have a really good estimate of exactly how much is going through estuaries versus going more directly to the shelves. It's going to require much more detailed processing-based uh, models for that. Um, but if we just take the difference here, um, about 30 to 40 are going through our estuaries and ocean margins and being removed there. Okay. So now we're getting a much bigger picture with a, quite a bit of spatial detail in a number of these. But what about the future? What does the future hold? Let's move, cycle back to the beginning of the talk where we talked about the problems that we're seeing in our coastal zones with high nitrogen and phosphorus inputs. So we did a scenario analysis using an integrated assessment model um, combined with the global news model in which we looked at various policy options and costs and how that affected nutrient sources and food and energy production around the world, and what that would then lead to in terms of nutrient export by rivers. And we're focusing here on the, just on this hot spot that I noted earlier in southern and eastern Asia. And what we can see is that in quite sort of a business as usual scenario, that the increase over that 40, 30 year period was expected to be quite high in southern and eastern Asia. But you also see that when we applied a very aggressive nitrogen mitigation scenario, that um, many areas um, had much less of an increase predicted and even some decreases relative to the year 2000. Well, how were those improvements achieved? Um, some by sewage connectivity, some by NOx controls, um, and some the major decrease actually came from more efficient management of nitrogen in agriculture and including also lower meat consumption. But what you can see here is that um, the nitrogen deposition could be decreased further as we address climate change, hopefully, um, and all, but also it really points out, I think, the big challenge in reducing the nitrogen inputs from agriculture. Um, as the population increases, as the wealth of people increases, and the demand for food increases, um, and also with climate change, as changes in water runoff occur, such as increased area, areas would have increased water runoff, we would be expected, according to the models, to be transporting more off the landscape into our rivers. So there are many challenges still before us. And just in summary, um, the um, there are many pathways by which nitrogen can move from the land into the oceans. Um, of the terrestrial nitrogen input, luckily, only about 20% of that actually ends up making it to the mouth of the rivers. Um, however, there has been about a two-fold increase in the export of nitrogen um, at the global scale mainly because of the large use of agriculture 
nitrogen or nitrogen in agriculture for our food and um, food production. Um, that is particularly evident, of course, where we have high population and a lot of agriculture in North America and Europe, but also very much so in Southern and Eastern Asia, where there's also a lot of fertilizer used and, of course, a large population. And about half of the inorganic nitrogen, at least, is coming into the coastal zone uh, globally in that region. While estuaries are removing about maybe 30% of the nitrogen through denitrification that comes in where, for, where there is a river coming in, um, where we do have an estuary, sorry. And, um, but actually, the shelves are a much more efficient removal mechanism or a removal site for nitrogen through denitrification. They're much larger area and long, in general, long, oftentimes longer water residence time, so longer for the nitrogen to move through the primary production cycle, get into the sediments, and be denitrified. It looks like somewhere around maybe 1 to 15 teragrams of nitrogen are making it from rivers, from, from sorry, the landscape by rivers into the open ocean, but a much larger pro percentage or much larger amount is being transported through the atmosphere um, from both combustion sources and from agriculture into the open ocean through atmospheric deposition. So there are many challenges still before us. Um, I think that some of the process-based modeling on the shelves, some of the things that we just heard from Androne were, can be very important in better understanding the dynamics in these shelf systems, as well as more um, dynamic modeling of our estuaries as well around the world. But a major challenge still before us in terms of how we're going to reduce the nutrient inputs or at least control them um, better in our coastal zones and help to mod moderate the effects of those um, throughout the world. So thank you. We have time for questions, and please use the microphones. I have a question. Is um, groundwater discharge, I'm right here, directly in front of you. Oh, right here. <laughs> Thank you. Is Sorry. groundwater dis discharge a significant term at all in export of land-based nitrogen to the ocean? So in some regions, I think that the groundwater can be an important source. Um, we don't have really good estimates globally of that, um, so I didn't talk about that, but, but certainly it needs to be considered. Um, I mean, you can even think of, for example, in, um, around, the, around um, uh, Central America, um, where you have very uh, uh, calcium carbonates, uh, landscape there where your water is not even going through many rivers but going right through and into uh, the coastal areas as well as off the south east coast of the US and I'm sure many other areas as well so it needs to be looked at um, regionally um, and it would be interesting to at some point to be able to look at that in a, a, a global pattern of that it seems to be important in Hawaii where high rainfall and porous Aha, uh -huh. all oh, right, so. there you go, yeah, thank you. There's a question over here on my left. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm glad you noted that um, meat was uh, part of the understanding of uh, the nitrogen um, cycle, but I, I noticed you didn't disaggregate it uh, when you, you listed uh, uh, various sources. You didn't actually disaggregate the meat um, consumption in. In view of the fact that meat consumption is going up around the world, uh, how, how does this project to uh, the uh, aggressive model that you put out? What was the last sentence? What so, was the so, so since considering that meat consumption is actually on the rise around the world, yes. uh -huh. okay, that's inconsistent with the aggressive controls that you were suggesting that, that would go out there. Right, yeah. So those are scenarios, right? So it tells us what we might hope for. Yeah, um, and um, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's what a scenario does. It tells us what, with quite aggressive um, policies, we might be able to achieve, and also what we might not be able to achieve, even with quite aggressive policies. So, you know, the question um, is, how do we plan for the future, um, knowing what might be not only possible, but probable? Yeah. So, question over here. Hi, uh, nice talk. 
So one of the interesting things is that China has an $11 billion a year budget for offshore aquaculture. Mm -hmm. And right. they're, they have been very actively um, putting out units to grow seaweed to specifically, it's sad that if they didn't do that, their real offshore pollution would be much worse. And we know that aquaculture is on the rise, not just in Asia, but around the world. So I wondered if you could discuss how that might uh, play into making use or changing the dynamics of some of the nitrogen balance in these coastal regions. Yeah, I know that's very important. And in fact, Lex Bauman has done an analysis of aquaculture around the world and the nitrogen um, inputs to coastal zones as a result of that. Um, a global, at the global scale, it's not as large as the river inputs, but locally it can be much larger. Um, off the coast of Chile, we did a little bit of work um, there. Um, and um, it looked like the... Um, that aquaculture certainly was an important um, component there in terms of the nitrogen coming into the coastal zone. And of course, if you're taking um, the, the feed for the aquaculture facility from the ocean, from fish, right, um, and making it into fish meal and, and feeding those fish in your coastal zone, you're also not just taking land-based nitrogen, but also ocean nitrogen and moving it in. But it can have this, a similar effect in terms of eutrophication of the uh, nutrient enrichment. So again, it's something that really needs to be looked at locally um, and regionally. Um, and as we increase the aquaculture in potentially many parts of the world, that certainly is something that needs to be considered. Thank you. Yeah. And including the organic component of that as well, which can have quite different effects. One more question. Okay. okay. Um, well, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in case you didn't know, today is K-12 day here at the Ocean Sciences meeting. We have about 40 K-12 students, mostly from middle and high school, some of whom happen to be sitting right here in uh, the second and third rows. So welcome to all of you. Uh, if you want to, uh, out the back of the room there as you leave after the next talk, not, not yet, but after the next talk, you can go to see some of their posters. So some of them have come, uh, done some uh, research and have come to present some of their posters to you. Uh, feel free to stop by. Our next talk is going to be introduced by Linda Duguay, who is president of ASLO. Linda? Yes, yes. thank you, Fred. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be here on behalf of ASLO and to welcome all of our ASLO members as well as our partner society members in AGU and TAS to the uh, Ocean Science 2018 and to our ASLO award plenary presentation by Dr. Elisa Levin of Scripps. And I just wanted to say, wow, hasn't this been a great meeting and what incredible pl plenary presentations we had both yesterday and today and I imagine on into the future. Um, ASLO is Pleased to be a member of the OSM 2018 team, and I want to thank the meetings committee members from all three societies for their very hard work and dedication to bringing us all a very fantastic program. I do want to recognize Kay Beidel, who was the ASLO chair, and Alessandra Conversi, who was the ASLO co-chair, and also Haley Scheibel, our ASLO student member. Believe me, I've been a, a meeting co-chair several times, both on behalf of ASLO and AGU, and it is a lot of hard work. And no matter how hard you try, yes, there's always going to be a session where the room's too small or the room's too big. And uh, yes, we always hear from you. And there's just nothing we can do. It just happens. I wish it didn't, but it does happen. Um, I also want to thank the fantastic staff members of all three societies working behind the scenes to keep things running smoothly. It really would not work without them. And I think as um, Fred alluded to before, we did have a divorce a number of years back and, and I was involved when the divorce happened and wasn't very happy with it. We split off and went to two separate meetings and then we've come back now. We've had some wonderful meetings. The three presidents, I think Fred mentioned, and the executive directors all met in Washington. 
Um, and uh, I think Mike alludes to the fact that we were mostly all women. I think Mike was the only uh, male member, who Mike is our president-elect, was the only male member at that meeting. And he just said, yeah, you women all get along. It's really different with the guys sometimes. <laughs> so that was interesting. <laughs> but those staffs really do keep the meeting going. And, and, and it's great, you know, bring your complaints to the presidents because then we can fix it with our staffs rather than complaining to them. So, um, and finally, I want to make a shout out. Um, i got to move this forward. Okay, I want to make a shout out and thank you to my outstanding, we call it Team ASLO. So we get together all our board members, our editors, our associate editors, our staff, and our publishing partner, John Wiley. We have a a, we have a fun day and a half meeting, sitting usually in a darkened room with no sunlight or photosynthesis to help us get through the day. Uh, it's usually a day and a half, but it, 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 is, a, it is a great experience, and they're a, they're a fantastic team to work with. And, of course, since it's February 14th, I don't want to leave without wishing you all a happy Valentine's, and I hope your Valentine's forgive you for being here in Portland, rather than at home with them. And now it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Kim Wicklin, Chair of our Awards Committee, who will introduce the Aslo Alfred C. Redfield Award for Lifetime Achievement. And again, I want to give a shout out to Claudia. I don't know if she's here. If you were at the plenary yesterday, she gave us an incredible highlight onto the, uh, the incredible, um, the incredible um, contributions that Redfield made to biogeochemical oceanography. I wish we could say biogeochemical physical oceanography, but I think he was mainly biogeochemical. So with that, I'll introduce Kim. All right, thank you, Linda. Well, as Linda said, I am Kim Wickland, and I'm the chair of the ASLO Awards Committee. So the ASLO Awards program has a, port a diverse portfolio of seven annual awards to honor achievements at all career stages, and also for excellence in education, publications, and for addressing environmental problems. And you can learn more about our awards and read about all our award winners this year at ASLO's website. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the recipient of the 2018 AC Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Lisa Levin. And the Redfield Award honors major long-term achievements in the aquatic sciences, including research, education, and service to the scientific community and to, to society as a whole. And Lisa Levin is Distinguished Professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego. And she's receiving the award for her extraordinary long-term contributions to understanding the composition and function of seafloor ecosystems, and for her leadership in identifying and communicating anthropogenic pressures on aquatic ecosystems with relevance to policies for sustainable, healthy seas. And beginning with her first publication in 1982, Lisa's had a profound influence on marine science through her broad research portfolio, her dedication to mentorship, and her commitment to stewardship of deep sea ecosystems. Lisa's research as a marine ecologist spans a diversity of topics and systems, including continental margin and deep sea ecosystem biology, wetland ecology, global change, and conservation. And a sampling of her signature contributions include studies of continental margin ecosystems that are subject to oxygen and sulfide stress and ocean acidification, the discovery of novel faunal biodiversity of deep sea ecosystems, including cold seeps and hot vents, and larval ecology of coastal marine populations. She's participated in or led over 40 oceanographic expeditions around the world, including the margins of the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans, where she's pioneered technologies and elegantly combined a variety of classic and modern methods to quantitatively study the most remote ocean environments. Lisa has more than 235 scientific publications that have been cited over 20,000 times, and she's an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and she's also an AGU fellow. And in addition to being an exemplary scientist, Lisa is also a mentor and role model in all of her endeavors. She's mentored numerous uh, students and postdocs and is director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation for six years, 
She developed interdisciplinary approaches to teaching ocean science problems and solutions uh, for graduate level programs. She's also made a great impact on educating and training scientists internationally as a visiting scholar in Namibia, South Africa, Senegal, Chile, and Peru. And beyond her impressive career as a researcher and educator, Lisa's also a recognized and very respected voice on threats to aquatic ecosystems. She's a leader in advancing conservation and observation of ocean environments, and she founded the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, which is devoted to promoting informed environmental management of the deep sea. And this is just one example of her dedication to aquatic conservation and policy. So please join me in congratulating Lisa Levin for receiving ASLO's Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm on. I, I can't tell you guys how humbling this is. It was just a total surprise. I came out of the blue. And uh, it, it's been pretty hard to decide what to do, but you're going to get a retrospective today of my career and the lessons that have emerged, I think. Uh, I want to really start by thanking ASLO and the Redfield, my Redfield nominators, and really all the people behind my lifetime of achievements. Uh, what you see up here are my students and staff and postdocs from Scripps, some from NC State. But what you don't see are the incredible number of collaborators. A lot of you guys are out there who've helped make my work possible. So I really want to start by thanking you now. I also want to thank the different funding agencies. I'm sure I left a few off, but these are the guys who for the last 30, 35 years have been funding my work. And then I really have to thank my husband, Dave Checkley, who's not here, for making it possible, possible for me to have a seagoing career while raising two kids and staying married. So all of you know that that is not very easy. <laughs> And happy Valentine's Day to Dave, who's back home. <laughs> OK. So uh, as you heard, I work on a lot, have worked on a lot of different topics over the years. And I'm actually going to try to touch on most of the, the main themes of my work and give you little vignettes, little tiny bits of benthos. And hopefully, those of you out there, especially the ones who don't work on benthos, will learn something new or maybe interesting. But I'm also going to try to extract some really basic messages from, that I've learned from doing all this work over the years. Uh, there they are, and you'll be hearing them. And the first one of, of these basic messages is that basic scientific knowledge acquired in almost any ocean ecosystem is going to provide the foundation we need for meeting the challenges of the future. Now, if somebody told me this when I was a grad student back in the 70s doing basic science, I don't think I would have believed them. But almost everything I do today uh, in a changing ocean is based on what I learned way back at the beginning. OK, and I told you this is going to be a retrospective, and, and it is, so especially these first couple of slides. I got interested in marine science in 1971. I was 16 years old. That's when NSF still put money in sending high school students to college for the summer. And I, they sent me to uh, Humboldt State to study marine biology, oceanography, and math. And I got to learn from the great Gary Bruska and the inner tidal at 4 AM. So NSF, if you're out there, that is probably the most important influence on my career. That program hasn't existed in decades, but it was really important. I went off to college, uh, and I became interested in invertebrate development and life histories by taking a four-person class from Bob Woolacott. It was me, one undergrad, and three graduate students. So those of you who teach out there, 
don't underestimate the importance of that lone little graduate student that decides to take your graduate course. You know, they, they, you might be the, their influencing factor. I, went, I was really fortunate the next year, still a college student, to go to Woods Hole as a summer fellow where John Stegeman mentored me, started a project on barnacle genetics back when we did um, acrylamide electrophoresis. Anybody remember that? <laughs> Ancient times. Uh, I spent a year as a consultant, taught me that I really needed more education, and I went, then went on to graduate school at Scripps. At the end of my first year at Scripps, I went off to Friday Harbor Labs, a fantastic place. Uh, it was there that I learned about worms from Christian Fauschel, Pete Mumars, Sally Wooden, convinced me to do a thesis on worms. I went back to Scripps, convinced Paul Dayton to take me on as a student. As his, as his PhD student, and from Paul, over the next five years, I learned to love nature, to be my own scientist, to follow my curiosity, and maybe the most important thing is how to laugh. Everybody's got to do that. Um, at the same time, Bob Hessler was at Scripps teaching deep sea biology. This, these were the years when hydrothermal vents were being discovered, and it was fascinating. So I, although I did a shallow water thesis, um, I was fortunate enough to learn about the deep sea, and I've got to thank Craig Smith, who's out there, for giving me my very first Alvin dive in 1980, 38 years ago. I went off a, a, on one of his cruises, part of his PhD thesis. So, but as I said, my original work was in Mission Bay, it, or it was in Tide Flats in Mission Bay, San Diego. I studied polychaetes, life history, dispersal, disturbance, competition, these were all the key ecological themes of the day. Uh, but at the same time, Scripps was an amazing place. It let us have uh, some freedom. And, I, I, and in parallel, I did a deep sea project with Craig Smith, looking at colonization in the deep sea, really actually asking some of the same shallow water questions, but in deep water. And so ever since this time, I've actually had one foot in shallow water and one foot in deep water and tried to keep both alive. When I left Scripps, I went on to Woods Hole. In those days, postdocs were one year long. I did one year of postdoc with some fantastic people. My mentors were Rudy Sheltema and Hal Caswell, but at the same time, I was in the same hall as these great benthic biologists, Howard Sanders and Fred Grassley. Um, and in those days, women scientists were really behind the scenes. Their wives, Amelie Sheltema and Judy Grassley, didn't get much attention or recognition, but they were also fantastic scientists working at Woods Hole. So I studied that worm you see up there, that is Streblus bio benedicti, and I'll come back to it. But I just, before I go on to talk about real science, I would like to just say that um, I just showed you a whole bunch of white men who were my mentors, and they were extremely important, but there were, have been many women role models that have influenced me along the way over these past 30 to 40 years that I've been trying to be a scientist, and I've had the good fortune of getting, of at least talking to all of these people except Rachel Carson. I would have loved to have talked to Rachel. Um, all right, I'm going to start talking about science now. And I guess I started with this one, worm Stribulus bio benedicti, and worked on it for 15 years. And the, the lesson for me is you actually can start a career on one species if you fi find the right one and ask the right questions. This species, uh, it turns out, exhibited two forms of reproduction. Uh, one form involved the production of small numbers of large yolky eggs that turned into non-feeding larvae, the other form, and called lecithotrophy, the other form had large numbers of small eggs that turned into long dispersing feeding larvae. That's called planktotrophy. And why this matters is this dichotomy reflects what we see in the entire invertebrate world, but we found this in one worm. And this worm, luckily for me, lived all over the United States, so I could study it as part of my PhD thesis, where it was lecithotrophic. In San Diego, I could study it in uh, Massachusetts as part of my postdoc where it was planktotrophic. And then when I took my first faculty job in North Carolina, it turns out planktotrophic and lecithotrophic forms both live there. And over the years, and I studied this species for 15 years with funding from NSF, 
uh, we, it was basically a model for studying the effects, the drivers of reproductive mode and the ecological, demographic, and evolutionary effects of reproductive mode. And I know I'm going to run out of time if I try to give you all the key results, but it's, it's been pretty amazing to be able to ask questions about paradigms and population fluctuation and um, effects of reproduction on demography and quantitative genetics of genetic correlations of life history traits all in one species, but it's been great. Okay, as I said, I moved to North Carolina State uh, for my first faculty job in 1982. I moved and it was there I met some incredible scientists who were not biologists and I learned the importance of interdisciplinary work. So I teamed up with Neil Blair, who's a biogeochemist, and Dave DeMaster, who's a radiochemist. You can see them up there. Uh, and we wanted to study how animals and sediments interacted and how it affected carbon cycling and fluxes and so on. And we had this cockamamie idea that what happens if we grew phytoplankton on C3 on C13 bicarbonate and created a label, an isotopic label on those diatoms um, that we could track in the ocean and even into the deep sea. So um, we did that, we grew them. This is old stuff now, but this was the first time it had been done. We deployed these labeled dried phytodetritus on the seafloor off North Carolina using the submersible and uh, and then we sampled them after a day, after a few days, after a year, and we learned some amazing things. We were able to track those, uh, that signal down into the sediments, into the inorganic form, down into the animals using, stable, using mass spec analyses. And what we learned is that phytodetritus, to our surprise actually, could be consumed at 800 meters on the deep sea floor extremely rapidly, could be subducted down 10 to 15 centimeters right away within a day, that once it gets down there, other animals living in the subsurface could eat that material, that fresh material. And it told us that the kinds of mixing rates that Dave was measuring with thorium-234 could be heavily influenced by what, by what happens just in the first few days of phytodetritus arriving on the seafloor. So um, what you see in the picture are these maldanid worms, bamboo worms, common name, subducting down the material. And basically, we consider these ecosystem engineers. I'll never forget the Journal of Marine Systems never let me put that expression in my abstract. I don't know why, but uh, I still consider them to be ecosystem engineers. Uh, somebody's laughing back there. Um, so at the same time that, uh, well, I should say, very early on, ONR funded me to study animal life on seamounts and seamount sediments, and whether it might influence, reflect current regimes and so on. But what I really discovered on seamounts, as I wandered around these specific seamounts, were these giant agglutinated protozoans called xenophilophores. I bet a bunch of you never heard of them. They're the size of your fist. They are a single-celled animal that agglutinates sediments. Um, and they have an amazing effect on the deep sea floor. They exhibit strong particle selection. They can, uh, we, teaming up with Dave, we saw they enhance uh, thorium-234 inventories. They basically attract or they um, modify particle flux. So they're areas of enhanced particle deposition and carbon flux, and they enhance animal life. They provide food for animals, they provide refuge for small animals, um, and they can even, in that baffle white form, they can even entrain larvae probably. So they serve as little biodiversity hotspots on the seafloor. I began studying them in the 90s, and pretty much kept them as a hobby because nobody ever funded me to study giant protozoans on the seafloor. But it's funny because even today, now, they are considered as vulnerable marine ecosystem indicators by the FAO in their management of deep sea environments. And uh, we're actually trying to understand their vulnerability to climate change in a, in a new report that's being prepared. Okay. Uh, I want to move on to another theme in my work. Uh, and the, the message from this theme is that the best questions are really the old ones that we've never had a chance to answer. 
but it helps to have new technology. We heard a lot about earlier about new technology, and it really makes a difference. But even back when I was a PhD student, I was asking questions about where do larvae go, how far do they travel, and, um, and when it came down to it, it seemed like it turned out to be easier to answer the question, where do settling larvae come from, how many of them self-recruit, and does, uh, do, do those connectivity patterns influence the animal fitness? So I began this work by trying to tag larvae with rare earth elements using neutron activation analysis at NC State. It was all very clunky and it didn't work out very well. So I moved to the use of natural trace element markers. Um, that work was started at Scripps with Claudio DeBacco, one of my, my early graduate students. We were um, looking at trace elements in crab larvae, trying to understand their migrations in and out of San Diego Bay. But uh, it turns out that this is a lot easier to do in animals that retain their larval structures when they settle, and it's easier to do in animals that have carbonate structures. So um, what we continued to do, and I did with my students over the next 15 years or so, was develop tools for trace, using trace elemental fingerprinting to study connectivity of invertebrates. It had been developed recently in fish and otoliths, but not for invertebrate larvae. So the assumptions of this technique are that the chemistry of carb carbonate structures like a larval shell reflect the waters in which they develop, and that multi-elemental fingerprints are imparted by the source waters to those larval structures, and that if we know those chemical fingerprints, we can reconstruct the origin of larvae. So to, do the, to apply this technique, you actually have to establish the source fingerprints while the larvae are in the water. So to do this, I worked with my, first with my student body, Becker, to develop an outplanting technique. We'd spawn mussel larvae and then outplant them right away in those little containers on moorings up and down the coast of Southern California over about a 100-kilometer stretch. Um, and we'd leave them out for a week, bring them back, and analyze their trace element signatures. A few weeks later, we collect new mussel recruits off the rocks. Those recruit, recruited larvae, the recruited individuals have a small larval shell retained at the base, and we could analyze the chemical signature and try to reconstruct where that larval shell had been laid down and where those recruits came from. All of this using laser ablation, ICPMS. We, we tracked new instrumentation along the way. So Claudia and I started with atomic absorption spectroscopy. But anyway, we did this for um, two species of mussels for six years, but then a bunch of other species. I worked with Jeff Cook on Garibaldi and Joel Faldry on California halibut, and uh, I had some great postdocs that you see up there. And, and uh, all this connectivity work, it turns out, were initially individual projects, but we cut everybody together who worked in the lab over about a 15-year period, pointed out that we had overlapping sites, overlapping times, and so we tried to ask questions about what controls connectivity in Southern California. And what we learned is that connectivity patterns vary with species, but it's because they have different spawning seasons, and because off Southern California, we have current reversals. So depending on when you spawn, your larvae go one way or another. In general, dispersal direction reflects current direction. We learned that self-recruitment, returning to your site of origin, is pretty high, 44 to 84%. And this means that, just on average, dispersal distances for all these different species really was pretty small, 15 to 30 kilometers, despite having long-lived planktonic larvae. For a number of these species, we could construct demographic models and ask about the importance of dispersal patterns and connectivity to demographic fitness. And almost always, it turned out the answer was it wasn't the most important thing, not as important as survivorship and fecundity, but often connectivity determined which of the other vital rates was dominating fitness. So I worked for many years on trace elemental fingerprinting to look at larval origins, but um, over time, as we got interested in climate change and ocean acidification, turns out my, my we started to look at trace elements as proxies. And uh, I worked with Christina Frieder and Mike Navarro on mussels and squid otoliths, and we actually found doing lab experiments that you could use uranium to calcium ratios as a pretty good proxy for exposure to pH. 
And we actually, in the case of the muscles, we're able to go back and look at all that, some of the historical fingerprinting samples and find out that we could tell whether our recruits had been exposed to low pH upwelling environments or not. Uh, we also use multi-elemental fingerprints um, and found that together, multiple elements could tell us something about exposure to climate change conditions. And my mo one of my more recent students, Kirk, has been looking at this in sea urchin tests, although probably uranium's not gonna be the answer there. All right, I would like to move now to wetland themes. I did a lot of work on wetlands, and this work has taught me that applied research can reveal a tremendous amount of basic science. In the systems I work on, it and I, I worked in restoration, wetland restoration and wetland plant invasion. And actually it turns out there are two sides of exactly the same coin, or maybe almost the same side. In one case, restoration involves planting core grass on newly dredged intertidal fats. In San Francisco Bay, plant invasion involves spartina or core grass growing out onto unvegetated tidal flats that occur naturally. So in both cases, we were able to use this kind of information, uh, use th this phenomenon, and I should mention we also looked at this in Venice Lagoon, Tijuana Estuary, a variety of other places, started in North Carolina. We could ask how wetland plants modify in faunal communities. We were able to find that the modification involved environmental controls, it involved changes in food webs, in even predator controls. And I just want to give you one sort of small example, coming back to isotopic enrichment. Turns out that somebody else discovered you could spray C13 bicarbonate on the surface of a, a tidal flat or a salt marsh and label the microalgae with a very heavy la carbon label. We did that in a restored salt marsh, and lo and behold, find out that, found out that the animals that eat those microalgae, the Ceratopagonid and Coronamid insects are um, the early successional species. And as we track communi in faunal communities over time, the late successional species, the Capitellas and Oligochaetes and things like that, actually don't like microalgae. They are probably detritivores. Well, we then developed labeling tools. We labeled the nitrogen fixers with N2, 15 labeled N2. We labeled the spartina with um, N15 ammonia. We labeled the bacteria with C13 acetate and so on. And working with Carolyn Curran, Marie Nordstrom and others, we could track actually who eats what in the salt marsh. Um, it turns out you can use these same tools for understanding the impact of invasive plants. So in San Francisco Bay, working with Ted Grossos and Carlos Niera, we labeled microalgae with C13, we labeled Spartina with N15, and what we discovered is the community changes that happen when plants invade the tidal flat um, are basically driven by changes in trophic structure. The amphipods, bivalves, and serratulid polychaetes that d disappeared during the invasion all turn out to be microalgal feeders. The tubifid oligochaetes and the capitella polychaetes that survived and thrived during the invasion all turn out to be detritophores that can eat Spartina detritus. Not very surprising, actually, but, but we were able to show this with the tracers. Okay. I, um, I know I'm racing through a like almost 40 year career here. Uh, but I want, I, the last couple of decades, I have spent a lot of time in the deep sea. And uh, this is really where I'm gonna go now with the rest of the talk. Working in the deep ocean has taught me to keep my eyes and mind open. And the other thing it's taught me is that collaborating is incredibly rewarding, both intellectually and emotionally. And my deep sea career has been all about collaboration. But I, I'm gonna start with oxygen. Many of you know that I work a lot on oxygen. I think some of you may have heard my plenary a couple years ago about oxygen uh, at Ocean Sciences, but I didn't always, I wasn't always interested in oxygen. And this is kind of a lesson on how you get into things. There's a lot of serendipity. So I was at sea in 1988 with Karen Wishner, Lauren Mullenau and others. And I was on an Alvin dive climbing the flanks of Volcano 7, a couple hundred kilometers off Acapulco, and it seemed like there was a lot of zonation. 900 meters, 
lots and lots of fish and shrimp. I went up 50 meters. They, they disappeared, and the rocks were covered with brittle stars. And I went up another 50 meters, and those disappeared, and the rocks were covered with sponges and polychaetes and crabs. And I went up another 50 meters, and there was, like, nothing. <laughs> nothing there at 750 meters. Now, this project had nothing to do with oxygen. It took us a little while to figure out that the reason that there was nothing on the top of Volcano 7 is because the oxygen was really low, 3.5 micromolar, and the Volcano 7 was sticking up into the middle of the oxygen minimum zone. So after this, I got really fascinated by oxygen and its impact on benthic communities, and I spent the next 30 years visiting oxygen minimum zones throughout the eastern Pacific, in the northern Indian Ocean, and off Namibia. And almost all of this work was done with the generosity of foreign collaborators, many of whom invited me onto their research vessels and um, collaborated scientifically. And you can see many of them there. They're from many countries. But if anybody asks me my favorite part of what I do, I have to say it is going to see and working with people from other countries. It is incredibly rewarding. So, so one of the things that I discovered after it didn't take long, actually, to discover that these low oxygen zones, oxygen minimum zones, are not dead zones, that the, but that there are many consequences of hypoxia for benthos on the margins. There are evolutionary consequences. We see an amazing array of animals evolving hemoglobin to grab oxygen. We see lots of morphological example, uh, uh, um, morpho lots of evolution um, to enhance surface area to volume ratios. We see changes in community structure, reduced body size, dominance by soft-bodied annelids and nematodes, um, density maxima um, at, transitions, at oxygen transition zones. I'm just looking because I see an inverted picture up there, and I hope that's not what the rest of you guys are seeing. <laughs> okay. Um, and I already showed you the amazing zonation that happens. It turns out that there are very, very sharp thresholds, oxygen thresholds in the ocean. So this is a figure from the Pakistan margin, what you see up here. Over, um, and if you move from 800 to 1,100 meters, you change oxygen. You go from 5 micromolar to 10 micromolar. But in that, in that period, or in that, uh, across those depths, you move from 4 amps domination to picking up macrofauna, to picking up megafauna, to picking up nekton. Just among macrofauna, you can go from one species being present to many species being present. And so all, there are dramatic changes in community structure, and they all have huge functional consequences. So over a five micromolar change, you can go from fully laminated sediments at 700 meters to fully bioturbated sediments at 1,000 or 1,100 meters. Uh, doing shipboard experiments with my colleagues, we found that this involves a shift from actually protozoan domination of carbon processing at the lowest oxygen, five micromolars higher, and all of a sudden the macro macrofauna can dominate carbon processing. Uh, in studying oxygen minimum zones, it's become apparent there are actually chemosynthetic ecosystems in some cases. There are a lot of symbiont-bearing animals that live there. Um, Carnivores tend to disappear in, ox in really low oxygen minimum zones. You can see this um, compiling station data. You sometimes find really strange behavior in oxygen minimum zones. Off Southern California, in a nearly anoxic basin, we found all the benthic snails up in, up in the water, upside down with their foot in the air, doing this parasailing thing, maybe trying to get away or maybe just trying to breathe. Uh, and I had a chance to do colonization experiments across the India oxygen minimum zone, and we found out that colonizers don't come when there's no oxygen. You increase the oxygen, you get more colonizers. You increase the oxygen even more by going a little deeper, you get even more colonizers. So these are all really esoteric studies, of, you know, trying to understand benthic worm communities on the deep sea is pretty weird and, and not of general interest, but what I discovered, if you stick with something long enough, its relevance is going to be revealed. And that happened in 2008 when a 
publications came out showing that oxygen minimum zones were expanding and that oxygen was declining off Southern California. A couple of years later, Ralph, uh, Ralph Keeling defined the term ocean deoxygenation. And all of a sudden, all of that research I've been doing turned out to be uh, insights into what our future ocean might look at or how animals can adapt to declining ocean by studying all those natural oxygen gradients. So I became more and more interested in climate change in the deep ocean, effects of oxygen loss, but also um, I realized that deoxygenation was not occurring by itself, that in the deep ocean was warming, becoming acidified, um, POC flexes were changing, and, uh, and so now there's an interest in really understanding what is going to happen to our ocean under these changes. And really, it turns out you can, I, I was able to go back with Eric Sperling and Christina Frieder and look at all those data I had collected over the past 30 years on cross-margin benthic community transects, which span these amazing gradients of oxygen, CO2, and temperature, natural gradients, and ask questions using variance partitioning tools about how those climate variables actually affect benthic diversity, benthic community structure. And I'm just gonna show you, for example, the diversity results. Turns out in the, Pacific, in the East Pacific, oxygen is the dominant uh, explanatory variable with a very clear threshold around seven micromolar. Um, in the Indian Ocean, PCO2 is the dominant explanatory threshold. Uh, variable with thresholds at 900 atmospheres. But oxygen's the next most important, but oxygen thresholds are much higher, maybe because that's a warmer ocean. But using these kind of, now they're historical data sets, um, we can actually go back and look at some very relevant modern questions. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say about oxygen. I have done a lot of work on methane seeps and I wanna touch on them briefly. You can't work on margins without stumbling into seeps. And I worked with Viv Kazibis and her magic microelectrodes early on. Uh, we were able to look at worms and measure sulfide right next to the worms. Same sediments that the worms were in, from sediment cores on the ship. Turns out that most animals, it seeps, most worms hate sulfide. They avoid it like the plague. But there's a couple of things, a couple of taxa that don't. Dorvaleid polychaetes, these tiny nondescript worms and um, vesicomyid polychaetes, who am, I'm already on the red. My gosh, I better run here. Okay, what, what, what I wanna tell you is that, um, you know, we were able to turn back to stable isotopes, find some amazing um, facts about these animals. We had lots and lots of dorvaleid polychaetes co-occurring with each other and almost nothing else. Turns out they were partitioning the microbial food resources. Every polychaete almost had its own isotopic signature. Who would have thought all these little worms that looked the same were all eating different food in seep sediments? We saw the same thing for gastropods on carbonate rocks at methane seeps. And I wanna point out the most amazing of our worms was uh, a new one, now called Perugia solei. Um, Andrew, my former student, Andrew Thurber, uh, and worked and found, in fact, this incredibly low isotopic signature. That comes from eating and getting carbon from archaea and archaeal lipids. And uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but this worm is probably the first known archivore, an animal that gets most of its carbon from archaea, okay? But you don't know too many of those. Uh, over the years, recent years even, we've discovered new seeps right in our own backyard. Who would have thunk? San Diego has some, Los Angeles has some, new seep habitats, new seep species doing all sorts of weird things, farming bacteria, um, new seep, new kinds of ecosystems like the hydrothermal seep and new kinds of uses of seeps by animals, including those from the background community. So there's been a lot of seep research. And um, I, I promise I'm coming to the end here. It looks like I have a, just a few minutes. Um, or maybe that's how much I'm over. I'm not even sure. Uh, but, but over these decades of doing all this research, the ocean has been changing, including the deep ocean. And we are now drilling for oil and gas deeper than we ever used to. We are fishing and bottom trawling deeper than we ever used to. We're poised to do seabed mining. 
We're going after genetic resources in the deep sea. There's some tourism going on. We're disposing of terrestrial mine tailings in the deep sea. We are sucking up a lot of carbon dioxide and excess heat into the deep sea. We got a lot of debris and plastic and contaminants making their way down into the deep sea. So this is a really different ocean than it was when I went off to Humboldt when I was 16 years old. And society is now faced with many, many decisions about how to, um, what to do with this environment and how to manage it. And this has really led me to a new career phase in my life. Um, it wasn't just gradual. I think a lot of my interest in doing something about this was stimulated by a sabbatical in Namibia in 2011 with my husband, where I found that the minerals ministry, the mining ministry, had leased out the prime Hake fishing grounds off Namibia without telling the fishing ministry. And they had leased them out for phosphate mining, okay, at 200 or 300 meters. This showed me that there was a real strong need for science and decision making, um, that, that there's a high relevance for deep sea biology. There wasn't a deep sea biologist in the country. Um, the need for communication across sectors and the integration of dis di uh, disciplines. And so working with others, we formed the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative to try to address these issues in general for the entire deep sea floor, that is environmental management in the face of growing human activity. And more recently, I've become involved in the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy, which actually makes the observations, it will, because we need deep ocean observations to try to, mat to inform management of the deep ocean floor. And this has led me to work with a lot of different types of uh, UN organizations in particular um, and others and to get very much involved in policy. And so I find myself now reaching out to publish in new venues and to reach much broader audiences uh, and to do things like go to the climate negotiations. And I would encourage any of you and to work with the IPCC and to try to think about, uh, I encourage everyone to try to think about ways to make your science relevant to policy because undoubtedly it is relevant. Um, I, I mean, you don't even have to think about it, you just have to reach out to the right people. Um, and I've had a lot of, I just want to give a shout out to the many people who have enabled the work that DOSI does in the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy. And, you know, the title of my talk is And Back Again. And in some ways, going into the halls of the UN is coming back onto land. But I have to say that you only have to look in your own backyard to find fascinating problems. And uh, for the last five years, I've also been working on applying all the basic science principles that I learned as a student, you can see some of these listed here, to what small invertebrates are doing in biofilters. We have them right um, along the shoreline of Scripps, cleaning up stormwater as it makes its way to the ocean. So you never know how you're going to be able to apply all that basic science that you should be learning right at the very beginning. And with that, I'm going to stop. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> And um, we uh, especially so sharing your nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> so we have time for one or two questions. Uh, if anybody would like to come to a microphone. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for your story about how you got into science. And I think it is important to mention it can start from high school or even earlier. Uh, early on in your presentation, you also mentioned interdisciplinary research, and then you gave many good examples of how it's possible and how it can lead to new discoveries. Uh, I'm wondering, can you provide perhaps three key points on how to start these interdisciplinary kind of collaborations? If, if for people that are young scientists or older scientists that realize they need to, but they're kind of afraid to get into that new realm? Well, for me, it was really easy. I was the only benthic person thrown into a marine earth and atmospheric sciences department full of other kinds of scientists. But if you're in a department full of people like yourselves, 
I'm not sure I know. I mean, my suggestion is read papers and then walk in, give somebody an email message or walk into somebody's office and tell them what you do and start talking. Or go up to somebody at their poster or talk at a meeting like this and start talking. In terms of you know, getting ideas of where to, of, of what to do that's interdisciplinary, that comes from taking basic courses at the very beginning. I have to say the Scripps education gives us core courses in physical, chemical, geological, and, and biological oceanography, and getting well-versed in the basics of all those fields will help you think in an interdisciplinary way. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks again, Lisa. Okay, thanks. That's it. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a great day.